What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we have the collab that no one expected or asked for. <laughs> so this week uh, I'm actually posting a video of an interview I did with Thomas DeLauer where I was interviewed for his channel. Now for those who don't know and may not remember, Thomas actually has made an appearance on What The Fitness a couple of times now on my channel. So why would I ever collab with somebody that I did a WTF on? Well, first off, Thomas has actually always been very friendly and nice, which made it hard to do what the fitness is on him because he was so darn nice. Darn you, Thomas. Over the last year, I have seen him start to evolve some of his views and really back off some of the stuff that he used to promote. And to me, if we are going to elicit true change and really try to get people to adopt a more evidence-based approach. That isn't gonna happen if we're not willing to reach across the aisle, so to speak, and listen to people and collaborate with them if they're willing to actually listen and have an intellectually honest conversation, which I think is what actually happened here. So I actually think you guys will really enjoy this video and you'll come out of it with some more respect for Thomas and hopefully learn some stuff as well. All right, guys, enjoy. Okay, so I've got Dr. Lane Norton here, which is awesome to have you. Thanks for coming on, Lane. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. And, you know, it's kind of funny just to, to give context. I mean, you and I have a little bit of history. I mean, I know it's, I'd say, what, you know, four or five years ago, probably at the height of it, um, you know, you called me out on some things. And at the time, it was frustrating because here I am building a brand, you know, just being like, why is this guy picking on me? You know, I'm like, like you, I was someone that was bullied in high school. So it's like, I, I take it super personal. And uh, I mean, we'll kind of get into the, I guess the details of that, but I've tried to come a long way with my brand and start looking at things from a different angle and understanding that, you know, perhaps earlier in my career, I was more, a little, little too cavalier, you know, understanding the biochemistry is a certain degree and, and making my own kind of, claims from it. And I've actually even deleted videos that I think don't align with where I stand today. And part of it is the evolution, right? Just me understanding A, a little bit more how the human body works, B, what works for me. But I wanted to bring you on because it's like, you are in some people's eyes, you would be like the opposite of what I talk about. But I think there's actually a lot of commonality when we kind of come together and talk about these things. So but I want you to introduce yourself, I mean, give people some context, because you were a nutrition PhD, you're the real deal, um, you know, no matter what people in the low carb or fasting community might say, you're, you're the real deal. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that uh, your viewers might, this might be the last person they expect on the other end of the line when they pull up the video. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, we've had a, a few discussions on, um, like over Instagram DMs and whatnot. And one of the things I, I respect about you is You've always been uh, super cordial, even if I haven't been in the past, which I appreciate. And, um, you know, I think we were talking about this before we went on, you know, to me, if I'm not willing to like let people change their minds or have a, have a new views or, or reach across the aisle as it were, then I'm just going to continue to, to talk to my own echo chamber and it's it just beat a dead horse and it's not going to help anybody. Yeah. And so I actually, I'm really excited to be on here with you because I do think it'll help a large amount of people um, and give people some more insights into understanding that I'm actually not against low carb diets and I'm not against keto. I just, when it comes to any sort of diet, I just want those to be uh, promoted responsibly yeah. and not make, you know, um, some of the claims that are out there. Yeah. So just for those who might not be familiar with me and, and my background, uh, you mentioned that you, you were bullied when you were younger. The same applies for me. That's how I got into weightlifting. And I always joke that I got into lifting weights to stop getting bullied and get attention from girls. And it, it didn't do either of those things. But um, I did fall in love with lifting weights. And uh, when I got to college, um, my just, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist, but uh, after getting into bodybuilding and, and being knew, knowing I wanted to be in the sciences, I switched my major to biochemistry, uh, graduated with a degree in biochemistry after four years, and uh, then went and did a PhD in nutritional sciences. My area of specificity was actually protein metabolism, but I did quite a bit of work with body composition and fat loss as well. And then uh, along the way, I, I, like I said, I described myself as, depending on six of one, half dozen of the other, 
a meathead who loves science or a science geek who loves to lift heavy stuff. And, um, you know, along the way, uh, turned pro in, in uh, natural bodybuilding, uh, turned pro in powerlifting, uh, won two national titles in powerlifting, and also uh, was a runner up at Worlds and uh, set a then squat world record in 2015, as well as a silver medal overall in the world championships. So, have had, I guess, if I had to pick out something that makes me unique, is I have the educational background, but I've also you know, applied it to myself. And then I've coached uh, over 2000 people over about a 15 year period. Um, and so I guess there's not a lot of people with that, with that sort of perspective of having the academics and having the personal application, and also having applied it to a bunch of other people. So I feel like some of the topics I kind of have a unique perspective on, and I'm happy to share those. Yeah. Awesome. And I, I definitely want to, I want my audience to be able to to learn from you. You know, I don't want this to be one of those situations where we're both just kind of beating a dead horse with it. We're actually actually learning because I have a lot to learn. I'm I'm not a nutrition PhD. I mean, this is something that my experience with keto has been my own ten year experience and sort of working backwards from there and just kind of falling in love with uh, the mechanistic actions or what seem to be and how it works with me. I think you know, one of the things that I could learn a lot from you in regard to is the whole fructose conversation. And it's been one that has been a topic of debate throughout the low carb community. But most of my experience surrounding fructose comes from purely the ketogenic side, how fructose affects ketogenesis, not so much how it affects other realms, right? And there's so much, it really is conflicting data and one of the things that I respect about you is you are very picky on study design. And I think that's sort of, as far as I'm concerned, like that's my next evolution of, of learning is, okay, rather than just understanding evidence-based nutrition, let's actually take a look at how these studies were designed. And you, know, you look at some studies and you see, okay, yes, there's going to be these increases in uh, different enzymatic activity that's going to ultimately increase more triglyceride content with fructose consumption. But then when you actually look at the data, you see that it's not controlled for calories and that can... So anyway, I just want to kind of like, what's like the 60 second sort of elevator pitch on fructose metabolism and how it potentially goes through, you know, conversion to fat, de novo lipogenesis. Like, where do we stand right now as of 2021? Yeah, so fructose is a little bit unique in that it's mostly metabolized in the liver. There are some, uh, there is fructokinase in the small, the intestines as well as the kidneys, but the majority of the metabolism is in the liver. And there was some thought for a, a period of time that, and this is still pervasive on social media, is that li fructose could contribute to fatty liver disease. If you look at the research on fatty liver, if you overfeed fructose, yes, you can develop fatty liver. But there was actually a study that compared uh, overfeeding saturated fat versus overfeeding fructose, same calories, and actually found that saturated fat increased liver fat 70% more than fructose did. So wow. they both increased liver fat, but saturated fat actually increased it way more. And so when I've brought that to different, uh, some, some um, low-carb advocate doctors out there who also advocate that saturated fat isn't that bad for you, I'm like, okay. Well, I grant you that if you overfeed fructose, it will increase liver fat. But then how do you say that saturated fat is okay if you're beating the horse about fructose being bad when straight up saturated fat increased liver fat 70% more? And by the way, I'm not saying you can't have saturated fat either. If you overfeed calories from anything, you increase liver fat. Yeah. And the, the studies are pretty clear on that. And getting back to study design, I mean, you really... When almost 99% of the time, when somebody sends me a study and says, how do you explain this? And it's, it's always a study that seems to go against, you know, the things I've said. Almost 99% of the time, I can look at the study design. I can look at the results. I can look at the statistics and say, okay, well, here's why they found this. Um, you have to understand the question you're asking. Then you have to design a study that can actually answer that question and then you really got to go through and say, is this what the data is actually telling me? And that's, I mean, I don't want to kind of pitch an ivory tower scenario where I'm just saying, well, if you don't have a PhD, then you, you know, you don't know anything because that's not true. But 
it is really, really difficult to read and interpret studies unless you have a long history of doing so yeah. and trying to pick out, you know, differences in study design or even right down to, you know, looking at methodology and saying, well, actually, based on what you're wanting to measure, the method you're using isn't even appropriate and validated for what you're trying to measure. So I think that's really, really difficult and difficult to convey. Yeah. And that's kind of what I try to do on my YouTube is say, okay, well, here's this study. Here's what they found. Here's what their conclusion was. Here's why I agree or disagree with their conclusion based on what their, what their data says. And when it comes to something like, let's again, let's take fructose again. What is the, what is the actual question? Does fructose cause fatty liver? If you overfeed it, yes. But I think one of the things I always tell people to, to ask question wise is compared to what? Yeah. Because nutrition is not as nutrition. If you're eating a lot of something or you're eating less of something, then by default, you're probably going to eat more of something else. True. Right. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. we have to look at what you're replacing with that. Now, if we look at, for example, when they do studies where they remove sugar sweetened beverages or they add sugar sweetened beverages, they show increases and decreases in liver fat. And I mean, that's very important. Yeah. But when they do the same studies and they equate for calories, they don't really see differences. I mean, even with something like high fructose corn syrup, if you equate calories, you just don't see differences in, in liver fat. Now, that being said, that is not, ab, you know, kind of abdicating uh, sugar sweetened beverages of their responsibility in the obesity epidemic because at the end of the day, people don't drink a Coke or a soft drink or a pop or whatever you guys, whatever the listener, you know, wherever you're at, the, the region, <laughs> what they call it. Um, where I grew up, it was soft drinks. But you don't drink one of those and say, well, that was 40 grams of carbohydrate. So I'm going to have a smaller serving of yeah. pasta at dinner, right? Like people don't do that. They're actually typically drinking this on top of stuff that they're already eating. So that's it. Yeah, that's, the, I mean, the question oh. is not as straightforward, right? It's, does it do this? Yes, it can. But if the question is, is it uniquely lipogenic or is it uniquely fattening to the body or the liver, then the evidence suggests that probably not on a per calorie basis. Yeah. But I mean, again, drinking a soda is a lot different than eating an apple, right? Exactly. Yes. So, and you're also talking, you know, when someone drinks a soda, that's a very large proportion of high fructose corn syrup that someone is consuming. So if they're drinking three or four sodas a day, you know, to the naked eye, you look at that and that would definitely demonstrate, okay, yes, it looks like this high fructose corn, fructose corn syrup is causing the problem when in reality, just as a proportion to everything else, it's just become the lion's share just by default, just because of, you know, how they're consuming it. But also you can't discount the, the hyper palatability effect. I mean, what else is that leading to, right? I mean, the, the blood sugar crash that comes after that and what are they eating after that, you know? Um, and I think another thing that's interesting about high fructose corn syrup, and I just want to make sure it's clear on my channel, because I think people think that high fructose corn syrup is pure fructose. I think it's what it's, it's like 60, 40, right? Like 60 fructose, 40, something like that. Depends on the high fructose corn syrup, but generally the, the average is about 55, 45. So 55 okay. fructose and 45 glucose. And I, so what's funny is when people get upset with me for debunking some things, what they don't realize is I probably believed in whatever they believed in at some point. And yeah. I think just the process of uh, going through grad school and having so many of my ideas absolutely obliterated by reading research and having my advisor just straight up tell me uh, that's nonsense and here's why um, yeah. really made me very skeptical. And I, I always take a, a skeptical approach to things. Yeah. But no, when I it comes to high fructose corn syrup, I was a big believer in the fact that high fructose corn syrup was uniquely fattening. I, I still remember back in 2003 being on bodybuilding message boards with some sci with some, some more evidence-based or scientific types talking about the mechanisms of fructose contributing to obesity via de novo lipogenesis or not having an impact on leptin and those sorts of things. And I felt very strongly that. And I, I remember being in 2004, my first year in grad school, I was at a mixer for the Nutritional Science Symposium. And one of the professors who actually did fructose research, he was right across the hall from me. He was talking to another professor. And that professor had said to him, well, 
you know, I really think that high fructose corn syrup is the cause of, you know, these obesity problems. And, and the professor who did this research said, you know, I think it's, a, it, it's definitely a contributor, uh, but it doesn't appear to be uniquely fattening. And the, the other professor said, but your own studies showed like liver fat increase in, in rats that were, you know, fed fructose. He said, yeah, that's because we fed them 70% of their entire diet from fructose. You you could you could not get that even if you tried like, yeah. literally like if you if you had one hundred percent of your calories from fructose from uh, sugar sweetened beverages you still wouldn't get seventy percent fructose from calories so I think it's important to understand a lot of times especially in animal research a lot of times we use animal research just to say okay can we induce an effect is there something weird that happens when we do X right? So if we do X, does Y happen? And since we know it's possible, then we go, okay, now what happens if we do it more physiologically? And then if we still do it in a rat or a mouse or whatever, and we still have an effect, then we say, okay, well now let's test it in humans. That tends to be the progression of how things go. And so, you know, unfortunately people really don't know the differences in levels of evidence, yeah. right? So yeah. a study comes out uh, in mice that says X and people go, oh my God, you know, that, that's it. I got to avoid this thing. But then something comes out in humans and says the opposite. And they say, well, I, all these studies contradict each other. I, I don't know what to believe. Well, no, the, the human randomized control trial is probably a lot better than, yeah. than the, the rodent study. Now, again, I'm somebody who all my research was in rodents and yeah. I think like rodent model of various things is very, very important, but it can only, it can only prompt us to ask the question in humans. And I'm, I'm grateful that my research was actually validated later in humans by mostly by uh, Stu Phillips, one of the lead protein researchers in the world. But again, we can't really make hard conclusions based on rodent data. There, yeah. There's not only differences in physiology, but you're able to exert a level of control over animals that just doesn't apply to human, like real world interaction, right? Well, not to a mention, lot of stuff. I mean, ethically, like what you can do, right? I mean, it's like, I mean, for example, the, a lot of the anti-aging studies, the longevity studies, it's just flat out, you can't necessarily, A, you can't really do that with a human because it's however long it would take, but B, even when you're looking at, at fasting models in, in rodents for uh, your sirtuin activation and things like that, it certainly can make sense but the data that you're getting from humans, although some of it still seems to line up, it's just, it's not the same. Because what are you gonna do, put someone in a metabolic chamber and starve them for a year? I mean, you can't, you can't really do that, right? So right. It's, it's, it's difficult. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of that too, you know, getting excited about a, a rodent model study and, and uh, you know, shouting it from the rooftops, right? And I think one of the <laughs> evolutions that I've made over the last year and a half, especially, is making a very clear notation. I still get excited about the research, right? I mean, it's just kind of who I am. I'm just an excitable person when it comes to that. But I make sure that I note that, hey, this is a rodent model. Like, absolutely, like, take note of this. Um, because as I've evolved, like, understanding that, and it's like so much of my content is geared towards just that, like the anti-aging piece or the longevity piece in general and understanding that. Um, and the data is just difficult. It's just, it's just, it's just tough. Yeah, and I think, you know, wh wh so when can we start to feel confident about various things? Well, I think, you know, if we've got that in vitro research and that seems to agree with the rodent or the animal research and that seems to agree with the human randomized control trials and that is pointing towards, you know, the meta-analyses and systematic reviews and, and most of those appear to be in alignment, well, then we feel very, very confident, yeah. right? And I think that's another thing to, to understand is like you very rarely hear scientists say, Things like this proves this yeah. or this is always this way or yeah. never this way. Or you don't, you don't really hear scientists make those. What, the, what they'll say is like, yeah, we feel pretty strongly this or, you know, these data lead us to conclude this. Right. It's it's one of those things where it's kind of like degrees of confidence. I, yeah. One of my friends who's a professor at Ole Miss, his name's Jeremy Lineke, and he I'll never forget, he gave a, a seminar where he said, you know, I have different degrees of um, uh, confidence in da data. So there's some things that I'd be willing to bet my toe on, and there's some things I'd be willing to bet my foot on. There's some things I'd be willing to bet my leg on, and there's some things <laughs> I'd be willing to bet my life on, right? Yeah. 
So, you know, you take something like, I'll always do this in all my seminars. My first opener is I'll take a pin and I'll drop it. And I'll say, hey, look, gravity worked again. But by the way, gravity isn't proven. You can't yeah. prove anything in science, you know. But we just have enough data points that I know that if I drop this pin, it'll drop towards the earth at 9.8 meters per second. You know, like we, we understand that that has been, has had so much validation to it that we're pretty darn confident in it. Right. But when it comes to things like, um, you know, intermittent fasting and, and longevity, it is, you know, the, the amount of people that, have, that think that that is like a clear cut, it absolutely shows that it, it is not clear cut at, at all. What, yeah. what is, what it does appear to, I tell you what, even the idea that caloric restriction prolongs lifespan is not clear cut in humans. Um, now, what, what I would say is clear cut is that, um, you know, obesity is a risk factor for uh, shortened lifespan and mortality and those sorts of things. Um, some people would argue with me there's a, a big push now that um, you can be healthy and have obesity. And to a certain degree, that is true. Yeah. However, um, I actually just did a video about this the other day. Um, if you take all things being equal, if you, there was a meta-analysis done where they looked at obese people with healthy level, healthy blood markers. So no high blood pressure, no off blood lipids, you know, blood glucose, fine blood insulin, basically metabolically healthy, obese. And you compare their mortality rates and incidence of cardiovascular disease to people who were not obese, but also metabolically healthy. Uh, the people who were not obese lived longer and had lower incidence of cardiovascular yeah. disease. So again, now that's not saying that those, metabolically healthy obese aren't relatively healthy because they still live longer than people who were uh, metabolically unhealthy. Yeah. But when things are compared straight up, when we compare apples to apples, you're not going to be as healthy as you could be if you were obese. So back to what I was saying, um, sorry, I always like to leave, give a lot of context. No, you're good. You're good. Um, back to what I was saying, it, it's not clear cut that caloric restriction actually prolongs lifespan in humans. And it's certainly not clear cut that intermittent fasting prolongs lifespan in humans. What appears to be relatively clear cut is if you do, uh, if you become overweight or obese and you're that way for a long time, that appears to be a risk factor for, for shortening your lifespan. Yeah. So, um, there are some, you know, uh, there was a, um, a study in monkeys that was pretty well, uh, documented where they calorically restricted them for, I believe it was 20% of their initial maintenance calories uh, throughout throughout adulthood, I want to say. And they did see a prolonging of lifespan on average. So to me, w what I tell people is like, listen, what the data appears to say to me is uh, try, try not to become obese. Yeah. And I think that yeah. you're going to get the majority of the benefits that way. Right. But some of this stuff's going to be really hard to pick out in humans. As you said, you can't throw a human in a metabolic chamber for, you know, a year. Yeah. And, um, that's one of the other things that people don't have a good grasp on is they'll say, well, why didn't this study do this? Or why didn't this study do this? And the answer to your question, my friends is always money, 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 <laughs> and money. Exactly. So, yep. Um, just to give some perspective, if you run a six week trial or four week trial with probably 10 people in a metabolic chamber, depending on what you're doing, it's going to be well above six figures. I mean, probably yeah. closer to half a million dollars, to be honest. So, and I know people have really good handle on that. And it's always like, also who's going to fund it. Right. Yeah. So um, either the government is going to fund it or it's going to be from private industry. There's, there's very, very, very few self-funded studies. And so that's one of the other big misnomers out there about research is people say, well, you know, the funding source, you know, what is the funding source and this yeah. and that. Listen, I can tell you that my research was funded by the Egg Nutrition Center and the, the National Dairy Council. I met one person from one of those places one time. It was at a conference. The meeting was about 90 seconds and it, was, it went something like this. Thank you so much for funding my research. I really appreciate it. Oh, we appreciate you doing the research. Thank you so much. And that was pretty much it. Now I had to give them reports every six months, but that was pretty much the limit of the interaction. Now I'm not saying that nefarious things never happen. They certainly do. Yeah. But that's why we, that's why we don't get excited about one study. Yeah. Right. 
I tell people, I used to get excited about single studies. Now I say, let me see a half dozen of them in a couple of meta-analyses and then I'll get really excited, right? Yeah, without a because doubt. Because yeah. you can almost always find a single study in isolation to support whatever you want to support. That's why looking at the consensus of the data is really important. And I'm not saying that everyone has to agree with the consensus, but it's important to understand what the consensus is and why it is that way and what the confidence is in that consensus. So, yeah, like I said, I think people have a really hard time differentiating between a, like a, I don't even want to say a poor quality study, but just, it's like they want every study to be able to answer every question yeah. of the universe. And, and studies aren't designed that way. We Studies are designed that they are controlled in such a way that you're answering one, maybe two questions um, usually in a very, very narrow window. And I think the problem more so is the over-interpretation of studies by the media and people on social yeah, media. Yeah. And again, it's one of those things where, you know, if you guys, those who watch my videos know, I usually don't make really broad claims and sweeping claims just because I know that a study could come out tomorrow that says the exact opposite thing. And it doesn't mean that somebody was paid off or anything like that. It just means that, Different populations with different methods, with different uh, study designs can produce different results. Yeah, no, dead on. And I mean, even with, you know, the intermittent fasting piece, like kind of coming back to that, it's even if we could say with more certainty that it does increase lifespan, we're not necessarily saying that intermittent fasting itself is doing the magic, right? It's not... It could be the fact that if you take a large amount of people that are intermittent fasting, even though they say they're not, there's a good chance they're probably restricting calories. I know it's the case with me, right? If I actually, if I, if I log and I track and I really try to unconsciously like just, just track and not really think about it, making changes. Yeah. I'm usually putting myself in a deficit and it's, and I try to explain this on my channel and sometimes I get backlash for it, but you know, yes, you could probably make some claims and say, yeah, I feel that intermittent fasting is, is good for longevity and good for lifespan. And if you back that data out, then you probably find that, oh, well, there's probably a caloric deficit at play as well alongside a bunch of other things. And it's not to say that it doesn't necessarily work, but it's just like you're saying, it's not absolute. We can't say this is the case or this is not the case. We have a bunch of other factors that are at play here. Okay, if intermittent fasting works because they're potentially reducing their caloric intake um, and maybe they're lighter and feeling better and maybe they're losing weight as a result of that, then maybe that's what's prolonging lifespan. And how many different levels of intricacy do we have to have before we have you know, confidence in that? And the stuff with longevity is so difficult because we're just now starting to look at that really aggressively anyway. So we're still decades away from having any more, <laughs> like I don't even wanna say concrete because just like you said, you can't really get it concrete, but we're still you know, decades away from even scratching the tip of the surface with it. Um, and I feel like I know that's something that you address a lot. And I think people automatically assume that you're anti-intermittent fasting because you default it back to caloric restriction. I mean, there's, little, there's things at play without a doubt, but I still tell people that with intermittent fasting, not to kind of digress, but kind of coming back to it, and the large majority of the results that you're having are probably from caloric restriction. But if it works for you, then by all means, freaking do it because that's great. If that is how your brain works, then awesome. Um, there's a lot of different reasons that I like to intermittent fast and you know, you know, some of it is lifestyle, some of it is brain, it's just how I feel mentally, especially when I'm filming and things like that. But then if you also look at the data, you see that people that are intermittent fasting, they still go through the same metabolic slowdown as people that are just doing a standard 20 or 25% deficit where they have you know, eight, 10 weeks and they're having a pretty significant reduction in their uh, basal metabolic rate. So that implies that, okay, yeah, you're still <laughs> kind of falling into that same bucket, right? Uh, I, just, I think it's important to address that. It's something I, I try to say in my videos more recently, but um, you know, the YouTube algorithm makes sure that not everyone sees your content all the time. So it's hard to get that message across to everybody. <laughs> Tell me about it. Um, yeah, I think you. Sorry, I dropped my pen. I think you bring up a a really interesting point. We talked about this a little bit before we got started. I think what people struggle with is first thing. They make associations that maybe they're associating the wrong thing. I'll give you an example. I had a client a long time ago who swore that they were um, gluten intolerant. So if I have gluten, I blow up. 
I said, okay. And like, you know, I have no reason to not believe them, but I started talking to them and dug a little bit deeper. And it turned out really the only time they were having gluten was when they were pretty much binge eating on a cheat meal, right? Whether it was pizza or hamburgers or whatever it was. And I said, okay, well, let's just try this. Okay. I want you to, you know, they'd been kind of tracking their calories a little bit. I said, I want you to eat two slices of bread uh, today and I want you to document what happens. And the next day I got an email saying, oh my God, I ate bread that didn't, it didn't, it didn't bloat me. And I said, well, yeah, you know, you're, you're, it makes sense. It, you know, if you're the only time you're consuming this was when you were, you know, having 5,000 calories from yeah. pizza, yeah. then absolutely. I mean, but so they were, whenever they would cut out gluten, they would feel like they made more progress, but it wasn't because of the gluten itself. It was because they were limiting calories by default and they were also choosing less hyper palatable foods. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think, so people make the wrong associations and then also people, and I'm guilty of this as well. We, we talked about this, but they find something that they, that worked for them or that they really enjoyed. And then instead of that being good enough, it's like they have to validate it to themselves as to why this is the best thing for everyone. Yeah. And I, I went through that with flexible dieting and I'll just tell the story. I used to really struggle with um, like when I was like 20, 21 with like binge eating because back then the big thing was eating clean, right? right. So you just, in terms yeah. of like the typical bodybuilder menu, you know, egg whites and oatmeal in the morning, chicken breast, broccoli and rice all day. And you know, not a whole lot else. Yeah. And uh, what I found was that like, you know, when I got exposed to foods that were outside of that meal plan, um, I would just end up binge eating on them. Yeah. And I kind of came to the point where I'm like, you know, I, I feel like it's probably not the one slice of pizza that's killing me, my progress. I feel like it's probably the fact that when I have one slice, I also have the whole pizza. <laughs> so I started saying, well, let, let me try and track my macros and just incorporate some of these treats so I don't feel so deprived, but still hit my calories. And I found that like for that, for me, it was like, it didn't even feel like dieting anymore. It just yeah. felt easy, right? But I recognize that not everybody's the same in that way. But some people, you know, depending on who you talk to, they'll tell you, man, I tried every diet and when I did low carb, I felt so... I felt so good. I didn't feel like I was dieting. It felt easy to me. Same thing for intermittent fasting, you know, go, go pick whichever. And when I had this experience with flexible dieting, I felt like, well, this is the solution for everybody. Yeah. Like if everybody just tracks their macros and hits and, and still can have the foods that they want, you're like this will fix everything. And, you know, come to find out that of course that that wasn't the solution for everybody. And we hear the term, you know, you got to find what works for you. Yeah. And I think people inherently believe that when it's what works for you, they think that every person is so physiologically different that you're like finding that magic key to your lock, right? That's for your own, unlocking your body's own physiology. I got to tell you, there's a few studies that have looked at like different genetic differences, especially the diet fit study where they looked at insulin secretion and, and randomized, or not randomized people. They, a lot of people to based on their levels of insulin secretion, based on their genetic profile into lower, uh, higher carb groups. And they basically found it didn't make a difference at all in fat loss. So, yeah. um, but what I think does make a difference is your personal preference. What feels easy to you and what feels easy appears to be very, very individually dependent. Yeah. So I know people who say, listen, I know you like to track your macros and stuff that stresses me out. Like that gives me so much anxiety and, and like, I hate doing it and you know, this and that. But if I intermittent fast, you know, I don't overeat, I feel fine. You know, I feel good. It feels easy. And so, you know, for me and then other people will say, oh, I tried intermittent fasting. What happened was I just ended up binge eating the rest of the day because yeah. I was so hungry. Right. Very common. And so it's. Yeah. In, if you want to lose fat, you have to restrict yourself in some way. Yeah. So to me, what the key is, is finding the method of restriction that feels the least restrictive for you. Yeah. And I think that a lot of that boils down to individual psychology and personal preference. 100%. But that's yeah. not really sexy and people don't like to hear that. They want well, that, what's the, what's the magic fat burning diet, you know? 
Well, fortunately, I think it is becoming sexier. I mean, I actually am noticing that I think people that are taking this unbelievably religious dogmatic approach towards one specific avenue are slowly getting kind of ousted. I really am seeing it happening. And it's just, I think it's, be it's becoming cooler to take a better like overall holistic look at, at the whole thing. And, you know, one of the things with, I guess why I like intermittent fasting fundamentally for me is that I feel like I experiment on myself all the time. I'm not always doing keto. People that are at least veterans of my channel know that, you know, I'm keto maybe seven months out of the year. I, I rotate in different things and I try different things. Intermittent fasting is one of those things where, okay, since it's a timing system, I can still apply it to whatever I want to do. And from a content perspective, it lends itself great because I can have essentially endless content on my own self-experimentation where I'm like, okay, I'm going to try intermittent fasting plus vegan. I'm going to try intermittent fasting with paleo. I'm going to try intermittent fasting with keto. And I'll report what works for me. Um, and it's fun. And, it, and I think that's the operative word, right? Like for people that are in the fitness industry or in the health industry or in the nutrition industry, it does kind of have to be fun to keep you going at it. And you said it perfectly. Why is that not enough sometimes? Why is just a passion not enough? Like, you know, it, it's... I think one of the things that you mentioned to me that you, uh, you know, had liked about my approach before is that like I don't have a problem just saying that this is what works for me and this is what I like. Um, and you know, before I used to preach it as gospel, and now it's a lot more of, hey, I like this. If you want to join me, join me, and I'll I'll share the details of it, and we can have some fun with it. But it's that lack of taking a big picture approach and just understanding that like what you can adhere to and what works for your psychology. Is a, is a big piece. I mean, I, I will say there's some interesting stuff, and I'm actually, I'm curious your opinion on this, like legitimately, with microbiome and, you know, glucose utilization and fatty acid oxidation, and short chain fatty acids, as far as bioindividuality is concerned, because I think, you know, like fundamentally, we're all very similar. Some obviously differences with, you know, maybe gene expression and certain things there. But, you know, I mean, again, we're just scratching the surface, who knows, but it's, kind of looking interesting, but the microbiome is so dang hard to research, so dang hard to back anything up with. Um, I mean, I'm just curious, like where kind of the research stands now, do you think that that could be playing a role in how people are, like some people are better at metabolizing glucose and some people aren't and, you know, so forth? Uh, so to answer your question, yeah, I think that absolutely probably plays a role. Um, how big that role is and how much we can actually modulate that in order to act as a therapeutic remains to be seen, right? So unfortunately, what tends to happen in the fitness industry is it's like, okay, we've identified the microbiome plays a role, and now you all must buy my probiotic because yeah. it's going to fix your gut microbiome and increase your insulin. And it's like, no, we don't, we don't know yeah. that. Um, in fact, there's some evidence that if you, if you already have a healthy gut microbiome, which most people are... If you're, if you're eating reasonably and getting enough fiber in, you probably do have a healthy gut microbiome. Oh, by the way, just because you have gas and bloating, by the way, doesn't mean that you have an unhealthy gut. Yeah, That's one exactly. of the big things. In fact, uh, if you're getting enough pre prebiotic fiber to gut microbiome, you probably should have some gas, yeah, uh, to I mean, be well, quite literally. honest. The literal definition of fiber is like to like it, FDA. It's, it has to be a, a fermentable demonstrable, which literally means it's breaking down into gas. Make gas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think a lot of people, you know, it's easy for charlatans to kind of try and sell this because like, oh, if you have, and they lift off, list off a bunch of symptoms that pretty much every single person has at, 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 a, at, a at some time in their life. But um, back to the original question, I, I do think it absolutely plays a role. Um, in fact, one of my lab mates during my PhD, she was doing her master's, her name's Suzanne Devkota. And she's actually one of the leading researchers on the gut microbiome. And she's doing some fascinating stuff. She's out in California, actually. If you ever want, I can put you in touch with her. That'd be awesome. Um, and um, we had her out to our office and we did like a podcast with her interview and those sorts of things. I mean, you know, she basically, so one of the funny things was the first thing we got in, we said, hey, do you want something to drink? She's like, yeah, I'll take a Diet Coke. So she's drinking a Diet Coke on our interview. And these people in the YouTube comments are like, she's obviously not a gut microbiome that is destroying her gut microbiome, you know, this and that. And it's like, do you really think you know more than somebody who's actually researching this topic? So, uh, by the way, um, all the human randomized control trials on diet soda don't show any difference in the gut microbiome that doesn't seem to affect 
at least in the doses given that a humans consume doesn't affect them. So yeah, that's definitely definitely what I have noticed. And you know, I've been bottoms up. I've been someone. <laughs> I've been someone that's demonized artificial sweeteners before. I definitely, definitely have, and I still do to some degree. But I have definitely realized that the dosages that we're given are are pretty extreme, right? Yeah. And when you look at a normal, healthy person, yeah, it's first of all, and also the data is extremely confusing. Like it's not uh, all the way down to like the cephalic insulin response. Like that piece. That could already be dictated by how your microbiome is to begin with, not necessarily the artificial sweeteners effect on it, right? Um, the cephalic insulin response, you know, like what saccharin is the one that seems to show, but it's, it's just so difficult because some people, it's like split down the middle, right? Acid sulfate, potassium, same kind of thing. It's like some see the cephalic insulin response, some don't. And I've tried to make that clear in videos that, you know, you, you if you're wearing a CGM or something, then maybe that can give you some data on yourself. And actually, before I forget too, when you were talking about kind of that uh, bio, bio individualism, kind of that, that piece, there was also an interesting study that I remember, uh, it was like 800 different participants and they all plugged them into a CGM. What was interesting was, you know, some had crazy high glucose spikes to cookies, some didn't. Some had crazy high spikes with bananas, some didn't. But the end, and, that was you know, in the moment, right? But at the end of the day, at the end of the study, the overall kind of weight loss and ultimate results were about the same. So that's what I find interesting. If you're getting down to like a super granular level and maybe you wanna just kind of you know, play biohacker with yourself and you know, then you gotta just test yourself, but take it for what it's worth because what you test today is probably gonna be different from what you test three days from now. And if you want to drive yourself crazy by trying to figure out everything that's going on, you know, be my guest. I do, and it literally makes me crazy sometimes. But um, <laughs> it's, I guess the point is, is that, yeah, when you look, especially at body composition, there's a lot of different ways to get to the same end result. And um, yes. I mean, I kind of just come in full circle back to, I guess, the original piece. And I want to be respectful of time. And one of the things that I really wanted to help get across to my viewers. And again, I'm going to catch you, up. Before you go on, let me just address that last sure. piece real quick, Thomas, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah, for um, sure. I think one of the reasons that, uh, so two things I want to address. Well, the first one is the reason a lot of people are actually gravitating towards personal preferences you said earlier is because if you just pay attention, you can, you can tell that some of these people just, what they're saying can't be true. Because they'll yeah. say things like, oh, if you're eating carbs, you can't lose fat or you can't burn fat. Yeah. And then you see an athlete who's eating 500 grams of carbs a day who gets shredded. Or you see somebody who loses 200 pounds and they said, yeah, I had 200 grams of carbohydrate a day. And it's like, okay, well, that can't possibly be – if what you're saying is true, that can't be true. Then you'll have vegans who say, oh, if you eat meat, it causes all these inflammatory things and like X, Y, Z – and it's like, okay, well, if that was true, then how is these people who are doing carnivore yeah. get this, right? Yep. So I think you, you said it. There's many paths to Rome. It doesn't mean they're all equal paths, but there are many paths to – there are many paths to health. Yeah. And maybe you're not on the perfect path, but a non-perfect path – by the way, we're all on the non-perfect path because <laughs> nobody knows what the perfect path is, yeah. right? And the non-perfect path – that still gets you 90% of the way there is a lot better than just getting frustrated and not doing anything. So I think, again, it's point. always compared to what, right? Yeah. No, so, very good point. And then getting back to the gut microbiome, I mean, basically talking to Suzanne, basically she said, what we understand right now is the following. Don't, get, don't become obese, exercise, eat enough fiber, and don't eat too much saturated fat. And that seems to be the the things that we understand right now for a healthy microbiome. And it does seem to, it possibly may affect calories in calories out. And this gets to a larger discussion, but people don't really understand what calories in calories out is. They think, Oh, I'm tracking my calories in and I'm tracking my calories out. And that's calories in calories out. <laughs> Good luck. What your Apple Ca watch says is not your actual calories out. That's correct. These are <laughs> estimate by about 25 to 95% yeah. depending on the, the product. Um, but you know, a great example, people say, well, you know, gut microbiome, the calories in, calories out doesn't account for that. Actually, it does. Because if your gut microbiome is a specific flora, that perhaps you're able to extract more calories out of the food you eat. Precisely. And absorb more calories. Well, that's more calories in. Yeah. Or perhaps it's having an impact on energy expenditure. Well, that's calories out, right? So no matter 
what you want to pick up, whether it's hormones or um, anything, just take your pick. If it's having an effect on fat loss, it's going to be somewhere in that calories in, calories out sides yeah. of the equation. Absolutely. Yep. But those are very, very hard to assess. And that's one of the things we, we try to keep. Just like, um, you know, keeping a budget is a great tool, even though you can never know exactly where all your money is at any one given time, right? And then you yeah. throw in things like interest rates and inflation and all that kind of stuff. But just because you can't traffic perfectly doesn't mean it's not a really useful tool for helping you figure out where your money's going, right? Yeah. And I, I kind of use that same example with, with tracking your calories. Yeah, no, that's... And, and I don't want to, I don't want to turn this into like a pitch or anything like that, but I will say like, you know, just as a side note, like carbon, your tracking app is awesome. And so if people are looking for like an app to track, like my net diary, my fitness pal are, are awesome, but there's some huge flaws that I can find with them. And again, I don't want to turn this into a pitch and this wasn't sponsored by carbon, anything like that. I will just say like, as far as like keto fasting, whatever, if you're tracking, like, you know, kudos to you. I think that's kind of how. Uh, a lot of, I was able to cross over a threshold and feel like, okay, I actually like really respect this app. So it was actually your app that kind of turned my way of thinking a little bit in terms of that evolution. So just, just FYI, I'll link out to it down below, but this is not sponsored in part by them, nothing like that. This is honestly just my own opinion on it. And I will say on the calories in, calories out thing, how I've kind of described it, which again, I catch a lot of flack for, is, I mean, it's still at the end of the day, think of a trying to like make it as colloquial as I can, but if you have a forest fire burning, okay, forest fire is burning. Sure, you might have different terrain, hormones, right? You might have the wind, you might have humidity. It doesn't change the fact that the fire is still burning. Right? And it, it just, it might influence it in certain ways, but it's not changing the math. It's just, it, it's altering it to some degree, but you're still measuring the fire. And trying to explain that, you know, Okay, let's. There's there's a you know different arguments out there with with keto and resting metabolic rate and things like that, and some of them are very flawed study design. I will admit, like you know, don't want to call out names a whole lot, but you know the Ludwig study and stuff like that. You know, yes, one could argue that yeah, maybe there's some more brown fat respiration and you you burn more calories on keto. Okay, let's outside of the picking that apart, let's just say that is 100% the case or 99% the case. Even if that was the case, it does not change the fact. In fact, it even, it, it even demonstrates even more that calories do matter, right? Because if you're, if you're making a statement that, okay, on keto, you're gonna burn more calories at rest. If you're making that statement, then right in that very statement, you are saying that calories are important and that they matter and that it's, and I think a lot of what's unfortunate, and I don't want to bag on my, you know, the keto community here, but this is where I've sort of branched off from them a little bit. And I catch flack, right? Because I, I try to look at things as much as I can in different angles. I know what works for me. But you cannot deny physics and math. Like, you cannot deny that. That is, there are lots of different things that are going to influence that. And a lot of people in the keto community will only reign on the uh, calories in, calories out model because they're just so stuck on you know carb insulin model, which has some interesting pieces to it, but it's still part of a bigger equation. And I don't think that people, even like people that are taking a look at the carb insulin theory and understanding that to the 10th degree, I think the respectable people within that world still understand that calories in, calories out matters. And I want to give you an opportunity to kind of explain that in, a, in a, I guess, a helpful way because I feel like people that do keto, they have a tendency to forget it. They get, just by very nature, people that do keto like to get wrapped up in the nuancy stuff. I, I found that with, you know, myself too. It's just, maybe Tinkers. it's, yeah, exactly. And they just, so they tend to like overthink these certain things. And I still try to say like within that respectable macronutrient range, there still needs to be like a deficit. You can't be eating, that deficit's gonna be hard for you to determine because yes, let's say for a minute that keto does change that. That just makes it more difficult because you're not sure where you're at. Um, but I want, I mean, you to explain it in maybe a way that might be helpful for people that are doing keto because it's still, I still think it's very important, obviously. Yeah, if you don't mind in indulging me, I'm just gonna, uh... I'm going to have my first correction for you on our, on our coaching app, which, um, so we, we, it does have a tracker in it, but the primary function of the app for people listening is actually to coach you on nutrition. So, uh, basically it will give you, um, based on your goal, 
based on, you know, your, your individual metabolism and the inputs you put in, it'll give you macronutrient recommendations and then it will adjust them each week based on how you're progressing. And we even have, I mean, it's funny when people say that I'm anti keto or anti low carb. If you look at the options for the different diet types, we have an option for ketogenic and for low carb. So low carb would be you know, not quite necessarily ketogenic, although some of them probably do slip into that area. But yeah, like that's, it's, it's been a, an awesome tool. And even people have said, wow, just, just tracking, just tracking. Even if you're not using the coaching portion of it, which I would tell anybody it's it, the coaching portion is worth it alone, but just tracking people become mind blown by, wow, I didn't realize what was in this, right. Yeah. Or I didn't realize how much I was actually eating and there's, there's studies and, and people get really offended by this. And I don't think there's any reason to get offended, but they show that people in studies underreport their food intake by 30 to 50%. Yeah. Uh, they overreport their, their activity by 50%. There was a study, I want to say it was in 96, a metabolic ward study where they had people come in who self-reported not being able to lose weight on 1,200 calories a day. And they told them, we are going to be able to know what you're eating. Like we will, we will know if you're, if you're not reporting accurately, we will know. Um, so they underreported by 50%, overreported their activity by 50%. And they actually argued with the researchers about how much they were eating, <laughs> which is pretty hilarious if you think about yeah. it. And a lot of people say, well, people lie. And I don't even think it's necessarily lying. I think a lot of people are really ignorant of portion sizes, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> Guys, if you ever want, if you've never had the experience of like weighing out everything you put in your mouth for like a week, um, even if you never do it again, it's really enlightening. And if yeah. you want to be depressed, go and weigh out a serving of ice cream, go weigh out a serving of nuts or peanut, peanut butter, butter <laughs> yeah, or exactly. cereal. Like you will be, you'll be like, wow. So actually what I thought was a serving was actually three or four. Yeah. Um, so th those are really important things to keep in mind is that. If you've never had that experience, and the other thing is people don't, people like grab handfuls of stuff throughout the day, and that's not something that registers, right? Like they just grab it, mindlessly eat it. That can add up to oh, hundreds if, of if calories eat, a day. If you, eat, if you eat out of the bulk bin section at Whole Foods, it doesn't count towards your calories. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but but um, getting to your question on the carb insulin model, I'm going to do a really quick, quick and dirty recap of the most current version of the carb insulin model, because it has changed a few times, but basically the, the, what the carb insulin model proposes is that we don't become fat because we overeat. We overeat because we become fat and we become yeah. fat because we eat too many refined carbohydrates. This raises our insulin levels. Insulin inhibits lipogenesis or lipolysis, which traps fat in fat cells, making it inaccessible to the rest of the body. Since it's, since those fat stores are not accessible to the rest of the body, we overeat in response to that. Yeah. And also there's, there's an element of, I know Ludwig's version has kind of insulin reducing, um, reducing your total daily energy expenditure, that sort of thing. And, you know, I think you, you mentioned Ludwig studies and those were yeah. probably the most, I would say over the last four years are the most compelling studies for people that want to say, aha, see, here you go. So I, I do want to address those, but first I'll address the, the carb insulin model a little bit more broadly. It, so, okay. Any of those things could be true, but if they are true, if all things are equal and we match diets in calories we should see that diets that are higher in refined carbohydrates, regardless of whether of being matched in calories, that those should produce either less fat loss or more fat gain. I mean, I think that's unequivocally yeah. a fact for the carb insulin model to be true. As of now, we have, I believe, 22 controlled feeding studies. When I say controlled, I mean the food was, I was either a metabolic ward or the food was provided to participants where they measure energy expenditure and or body composition. And what we see is the summation of those studies is virtually no difference in body composition and virtually no difference in energy expenditure when calories and protein are equated. 
Um, and that is even with, you know, differences in insulin levels in many of these studies. And in fact, even in some studies, I'm, I'm thinking of um, Sirwit et al. back from 2001, I want to say, they compared uh, big differences in glycemic index diets. So they had one diet that was totally equated in macros. All the macros were equal. And the only difference was one diet was over 100 grams of sugar a day in the form of sucrose. And the other diet was about 10 grams. So we're talking about a tenfold difference in sugar. I mean, yeah. that's pretty extreme. And if we were, I mean, we would expect to see something. And I believe it was in a... I believe it was an obese. I could be wrong, but I believe it was an obese. And they showed they both groups lost the exact same amount of weight, exact same amount of fat, and almost all their blood markers improved to a similar extent. The only one that was a little bit different was uh, LDL cholesterol improved more in the low glycemic diet, but that was probably because they were higher in fiber. Exactly. Yeah, um, that makes sense. The other, th so that's one part of it. So that we don't see those differences. Um, and the other part of it is w the most effective drug we have for treating obesity is a drug called semiglutide. And there's another one in the family called liraglutide. Both those drugs are GLP-1 mimetics that increase insulin levels. Uh, and so if, if the carb insulin model is true and you're giving a drug that increases insulin, at least in the short term, because... Gary Taubes has argued that, well, if you look after, you know, the end of these people, like their diets or the end of their treatments, their insulin levels are lower, but that's because they lose a huge amount of weight. That's why their basal insulin levels drop. But initially when they give these GLP-1 mimetics, it raises their insulin. Yeah. And based on the carb insulin model, that should result in fat gain, but it doesn't. They actually lose, I think the average amount of weight loss is around 10 to 15% of body weight, which is really substantial. Yeah. Um, and so again, and by the way, it's through uh, appetite suppression. These people just, um, they eat less. Yeah. So, but again, like that's insulin is according to the carb insulin model is supposed to stimulate hunger. So again, you're giving something that all things being equal increases your insulin levels you would inspect you would expect more calorie calorie consumption and less energy expenditure but you don't see either of those things yeah and when, when you look at the you know even the basics of it i can I, I can see that you can see where both sides are coming from but i mean just at the very basics of it if insulin is elevated shortly after a meal then it would make sense that that's going to drive down appetite like that. So I can see, you know, obviously where they're coming from with that. I live in that community, so I see it all the time. And, but then when you look at, okay, here's what happens after you eat food and here's your insulin response. And then here's the subsequent, you know, insulin drop and glucagon. It's okay. You, you could look at both sides, right? So it's like, cause I, I often say that like after a meal, when insulin has come back down and glucagon, like during that period of time, when you're hungry, at least in the fitness world, and saying like, okay, that is that is a nice opportune time where you're, yeah, you're, you're losing weight. If you're if you're hungry, I don't want to say you're automatically losing weight, but it's a, it's kind of an indicator, right? When glucagon is is perking up and you're kind of getting this, yeah, you're probably in that at that point in time. Which, when you look at that data, it's it's a little bit confusing, and it's part of it's maybe me, maybe I'm not understanding it all the way, but with carb insulin model there's some p holes that I definitely would poke in it, you know, as far as that is concerned too. Like, I, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense that every time we eat, we're stopping everything because that would imply that if I were to consume a grain of rice, like every, uh, you know, 10 minutes or something, I don't know, hypothetically, right, that I wouldn't lose weight um, or wouldn't lose fat. So I think there's a, a lot of holes to be poked and a lot of ground to be covered there. Yeah, I think... Um you know, appetite in and of itself is extremely complicated. I took a, a, a six month module on appetite as a graduate student and left basically saying, we have no idea about appetite. Uh, trying to, we, we tried to say, well, insulin maybe does this. Well, it looks like insulin may be involved in suppressing appetite and stimulating appetite. Glucagon, kind of the same thing. A lot of it depends on the overall hormonal milieu that's yeah. present that's a good in the point. situation that's in. There's also sociological inputs. There's psychological inputs. Uh, it, it, it's ex extremely complicated. Um, I still 
don't feel like the research has a good grasp on the overall holistic view of what increases or decreases appetite. We, we feel like we know some things, but we're very far behind on that literature. Yeah. As for the, the, the carbohydrate insulin model, I think getting into these studies, so there are some studies that showed that if you fed a low carb diet, there was an increase in energy expenditure mm -hmm. and relative to a higher carb diet. And I think what's really important again is to point out study design and why it's so important. So when we want to measure total daily energy expenditure in a, po in a large population, we do it using what's called doubly labeled water. Now doubly labeled water means there is a stable isotope label on the hydrogen as well as the oxygen of water. And stable isotopes allow us to basically trace, it's called a metabolic tracer, where these labels are going because we can look at the concentrations of them on what's called a, a GC, uh, GCMS, which is a gas chromatography mass spectroscopy unit. It's actually what I used uh, to measure protein synthesis for my graduate school work. We used a metabolic tracer. So I'm actually pretty familiar with this kind of stuff. The problem with doubly labeled water is you have to understand that it's what's called a surrogate measure. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Doubly labeled water is validated against metabolic chamber. So metabolic chamber is a direct measurement of metabolic rate. So that is your, your direct measurement. And so in order to figure out if doubly labeled water is accurate, they measured it against metabolic chamber and found a correlation of about point, an R of 0.8, which isn't perfect, but pretty good. Um, that would be like saying, well, calipers are validated against DEXA, right? DEXA is the most direct measurement of body fat that we know of other than somebody dying and you excising their fat tissue. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. so, so that's important to understand, a surrogate measurement versus the direct measurement. Now, one of the problems with doubly labeled water is in low carb, in low carb diets, it has not been validated. And in fact, there's some evidence that it overestimates energy expenditure in people on low carb diets. And this appears to be because um, it causes you to produce more CO2 than we would predict. Uh, and that, that production of CO2, which is one of the ways you get the label of the oxygen out, that production of CO2 is part of the equation that goes into determining your total daily energy expenditure. So why, why is this all important? Well, there was a study that was done at Harvard where they looked at, okay, we're going to have people lose weight and then we are going to randomize them to three different groups, maintenance groups, where they're going to get different levels of carbohydrate. So they either had 20% of calories from carbohydrate, 40% or 60%. And they showed that from the lowest level of carbohydrate to the highest level of carbohydrate, there was about a 400 calorie per day difference in energy expenditure. Sounds really impressive, really awesome. But once again, doubly labeled water is not validated against... Uh, for low carb diets. Yeah. Now, in fact, in one study where they did uh, metabolic chamber versus doubly labeled water for low carb diets, the R correlation was only 0.5, which is much weaker than a 0.8. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's take all that away. Let's say there was this increase in energy expenditure. If there was a real increase in total daily energy expenditure, we'd expect that to show up in a few different places, either their basal metabolic rate, their physical activity, be it purposeful or non-purposeful, so exercise or non-exercise activity, um, or in like their thermic effect of food, which is really small compared to the other yeah, ones. Yeah, two or three percent at the most. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the problem with these this this study is based on their pre-registered trial. We know that they took body weight. We know they took body composition. Neither of those were reported. If they were really seeing this increase in energy expenditure, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to do doubly labeled water on these folks. Yeah. How much does it cost to slide a scale under their feet? Yeah. Why is that data not reported? So, I mean, because if you really saw a 400 calorie per day difference, there should be weight loss. There will absolutely be weight loss with that. And so... I'm skeptical based on that. They did report their BMR, their basal metabolic rate, which was not different between groups. 
They reported their physical activity was not different between groups. So where is this massive increase in energy expenditure coming from? I mean, you're basically left with TEF and TEF as a whole probably doesn't even make up 400 calories a day, let alone the fact that protein is the most powerful uh, macronutrient to affect TEF. And even if you double protein, you only get about 100 calories more per day of TEF. So it just doesn't make sense. There's, there's, they don't have a good explanation for where this increase in energy expenditure comes from. And then he also did a meta-analysis where they basically, it was a reanalysis of a, a meta-analysis that was done that basically said there's no difference in energy expenditure between low-carb diets or high-carb diets when protein and calories are matched. I referenced it earlier. It's by Kevin Hall. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, <coughs> well, they just weren't low-carb adapted. And apparently there's, according to them, there's some big increase in energy expenditure once you become low carb adapted. I think it's the opposite. Right. So actually, yeah. uh, Kevin Hall's study suggested it was the opposite. It suggested yeah. there was actually an increase in energy expenditure small, like 50 to 100 calories a day yep. during the initial adaptation. But after about a week, that went away. Um, so long story short, he separated this meta-analysis into short-term studies, which were shorter than 17 days, or long-term studies, which were longer than 17 days. Never gave a really good validation for why 17 days was chosen. Yeah. But basically, what you're, he showed that in the long-term days, that energy expenditure was higher amongst low-carb diets. Yeah. Okay. But when you look at the way they had conducted the meta-analyses, when both metabolic chamber data and doubly labeled water data were available, they only used the doubly labeled water data. Mm. Now that does not make any sense to me. So if you're telling me you have DEXA and calipers available, you chose to use the calipers. Why? You're using the surrogate measurement instead of the direct measurement. That doesn't make sense. And so, um, because what you're looking at is if it's longer than 17 days, most of the studies on energy expenditure are going to be with doubly labeled water and not metabolic chamber exactly, because yeah. you can't house people for very long in a metabolic chamber because you have to pay them because you're basically keeping them in food jail. Yeah. Um, and once again, I went, I actually went through those studies, like every single study and looked at the ones that actually reported like weight and body composition. And the funny thing is even the ones reporting differences in energy expenditure did not show differences in weight or body composition. So, what do we care about? Do we care about this random number showing energy expenditure or do we care about actual fat loss or weight loss? Yeah. And that, I mean, to me, I care about fat loss and weight loss, right? So I don't, I'm not saying that there's nefarious things are going on or anything like that. What I'm saying is if you want to get the answer to the question, you have to ask the right question and then you have to design the study appropriately to answer that question. Yeah, yeah and it's, I mean, and to shed light on, like why someone when they're first starting a low carb or keto diet might end up having an increase in their metabolic rate, even just, you know, I think it ended up being refuted more to probably like 60 to 40 maybe versus I think it was like 135 to 150 or something that was, uh, you know, purported. But it's it generally comes from, it's a, it's a hormetic stressor. I mean, you're stressing your body. So I mean, to that degree, that level of adaptation is going to take some energy. And it's, so that's just to give context, just, you know, for people that are watching or listening, it's, and that, that's not surprising. And one of the things that I try to explain that is very important is that, you know, you, you still want a level of efficiency to some point. I think there's this like infatuation with inefficiency um, because people think that inefficiency automatically means that you're magically incinerating calories into thin air. No, it's not necessarily the case. I mean, there's, there's arguments with uncoupling proteins and with, with ketones and uncoupling proteins, the data is kind of all over the place. And a lot of it, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, you know, it's going to be in cultured cells. So it's really difficult to look at, right. Um, or in rodent models where you see, you know, brown fat increases and things like that. And there's been increases in like mitochondrial respiration. But what's interesting is increases in mitochondrial respiration, but no changes in ATP, which could explain some things, like, right? You're not having an increase in actual energy, you're having an increase in just uh, possibly uncoupling proteins that are just dissipating energy as heat, but it all comes at a certain cost. It's not magically vanishing into, into thin air. And having to look at someone that is truly fat adapted, and I know that's a term that's thrown around a lot, but when you look at you know, someone that has been doing keto for 
six months, 12 months, and you actually start to see uh, some legitimate changes in terms of how their mitochondria utilize ketones or utilize you know, fats, um, you know, then that kind, of, that kind of tails off and you start to see, okay, it kind of comes back to a baseline efficiency. And then at that rate, it just simply does come down to what works best for you. And for me, as someone that was an endurance athlete prior to uh, you know, being very overweight, I guess I should give context here. You know, I was very overweight before. I was 100 pounds overweight. And yes, I was still hitting the gym. I still had some you know, muscle on me. But when I, keto worked for me when nothing else really would because I just, I'm one of those guys that if I start having carbs, I turn into a carb monster. Like I'm just one of those guys. And I, I, meaning like I, I get the taste of it and I, I go for it. So keto just worked well for me for that. I'm long past the stages where I'm trying to like prevent weight regain and things like that. For me, it's all about what works for me from a performance standpoint. And I was an endurance athlete before I was overweight, before I was ever into strength training and things like that. So that kind of makes sense in terms of the efficiency as far as the body utilizing fats as a fuel source during that point in time. Like obviously beta oxidation, you're using fats anyway during certain stages of aerobic activity. Um, and just, I want to point out real quick that like any of that stuff is, is totally possible because people will send me stuff like, you know, mitochondrial uncoupling and respiration and whatnot. They'll say, what do you think? Like this is, you know, this way. I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's totally possible. But again, remember if it's having a big impact on fat loss, we're going to see that show up in actual fat loss. Right. Yeah. So that's why I think it's important for people to always remember that like, yeah, uncoupling proteins matter, all this stuff matters, but it's still gonna show up in calories in, calories out in one way or another. Yeah. And so. Totally true, totally true. Right, and so I and, and with, with regards to the, the initial bump in inefficiency, part of it too may be also that you tend to eliminate more ketones in urine good um, point. initially. Yeah. And so you're losing some calories that way as well. But yeah, to me, the argument that, okay, it, somehow at 17 days, this magically flips that you actually burn more calories, that seems weird and not really, you don't really see that in other metabolic processes, right? Yeah. So it tends to be the opposite. Like, and even like if you're switching to a really high carb diet from a low carb diet, there's probably some inefficiency. Yeah, there I was just going to well. say, you, you probably yeah. see similar things. Yeah. And it's in, and not to interject, but I mean, what. No, go what ahead. What I've fallen in, in sort of in love with with this whole thing, and I think it comes full circle, is you kind of have to fall in love with the stressor aspect of it, right? Because you same kind of thing. I caught a lot of flack for this one too, because it sounds it sounded like I was raining on the the keto crowd, but it's very true. If you're going keto for an extended period of time, there is a level of glucose intolerance that happens. Okay, it's just yep. you're. you're mitochondria your, your, it learns how to use a given substrate. If you don't use it, you lose it in a certain fashion. And glucose intolerance can absolutely occur. And it's one of the reasons why when people are keto for a very strict amount of time, and then all of a sudden they, they binge on a bunch of carbohydrates, a bunch of refined starches, they feel, they feel extraordinarily bad, you know, and because you're literally running head first into a massive inefficiency. And that's going to trigger heaven knows what, right? So, but being able to sort of embrace that is one of the things that makes it awesome, right? We embrace going to the gym and pushing ourselves against a stressor. We embrace periods of, uh, you know, in, in my world, fasting as a hormetic stressor, uh, even strategic gaps in between meals. You know, when you actually log your food and track your food and you don't eat uh, for three hours or four hours after eating, you surprise people think, oh, I'm eating six square meals a day. Okay, well, it's, and I still lost weight, yes, absolutely. But have you ever stopped to think that maybe because you're tracking and you're eating six very defined meals that you're not snacking in between those meals? And that's a huge player. And yeah, they've actually shown that just structured, regimented food intake, regardless of like tracking, will actually lower calorie intake. So yeah. if you eat in a structured manner, it actually lowers calorie intake typically. That makes perfect sense. And I guess my, my words of wisdom for whatever they're worth, are, you know, take these things that you see from these, these models, these studies, and, and do what you want with them, but use them, use, use them as motivation, use them as inspiration for whatever you want to do. I'd say, I mean, a lot of the content on my channel is there just to keep people going, right? People that are doing low carb, they want to hear about this stuff because it gives them that, that extra juice to keep it going. And, you know, 
I, I feel like that's the case for whatever you're doing. You know, if you're a vegan, you probably get your rocks off a little bit by finding a new study that looks like it rains on meat consumption, right? So if that's what keeps you going, then that's okay. You just gotta keep it in check too. And I guess my point with the whole hormetic stressors and everything like that, I mean, that's just, I'm into that stuff, right? I feel like maybe it's a little bit of, I like torturing myself. I like, I like my ice baths, I like saunas. I like that stuff because it's a stressor and it feels good. And I, I can't help but feel like when you're up against some kind of stressor, there is an adaptation that's going to occur. Um, and that's a stressor on the body just in its very sense, right? So of course you're gonna be up against some kind of adaptation or inefficiency that's going to temporarily increase metabolic rate for whatever reason. It doesn't mean it's gonna stick forever. It doesn't mean that if you go and you hit that sauna at 200 degrees every single day, that you're gonna get the same effect every single day. Um, and I think it's just important for people to know that it's not a, none of this stuff is a magic pill. It's just, it's just how the body works. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of stuff to unpack there. I think that you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll get people who DM me and say, well, you say this about this diet, but I felt great on it. I said, okay, so do it. And they'll be like, but you, you said you didn't like it. I said, no, that's not what I said. I said that it wasn't magic. I didn't say that you couldn't do it. You know, and I said, just be careful about recommending it to other people or telling other people what's going to happen. Right. But again, you know, people say, Lane, do you think sauna can help you build muscle because you know, X, Y, Z. And I say, no, but if you like it, go ahead and do it, right? Because if you feel good after that, I mean, it's funny. So a while back, I had a video series, and in one of the videos, like I, I was um, documenting my fat loss journey from, lo I was losing uh, 30 pounds, dropping down a weight class in powerlifting. And um, so I would do we a weekly like pose down, basically, to show like my progress. And I had cupping marks on me one week. And I got so many people who were like, how can you do that? That is not evidence-based, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, first off, I'm not making any claims about it. I never said that you should get cupping. I never said it was evidence-based. I never said it was would do anything. You're just looking at me and, and making assumptions. And also, um, I just like the way it feels. And I can tell you that the literature doesn't really support it as having any kind of use or, or, or magic, but... If I like the way the, it feels and I like getting massage and my massage therapist likes doing it, what's the skin off your back, right? So if somebody says to me, hey, you know, I, I did whatever. People think, you know, carnivore, for example. Um, I feel good on it. You know, I've lost a bunch of weight. I would say, okay, well, maybe understands here's the downsides to that diet. But hey, you've lost some weight. You've kept it off. Like you're probably healthier than you were eating a bunch of junk food. So by all means, like it, it's better than the alternative for you. Right. So, I mean, I tell people I'm kind of a diet agnostic, to be honest. Like yeah. I, I do what I like. I do what I like. I talk about it to people who want to listen and, uh, but I don't really care what diet you want to be on. But when people start making claims about certain diets they're on, that's when I'll, you know, kind of butt in, especially, you know, especially if people are kind of like driving that fear train or, or, you know, looking to make a profit off, you know, kind of, um, scaring people over stuff. Cause I think the other thing that's really missed here, and maybe people don't understand why I get so passionate about this stuff is I see how common, maybe not eating disorders, but disorder in eating or food anxiety is. Yeah. And it's like, people think that like, if they have, you know, a, a half a bite of an apple, they're going to, you know, uh, you know, have a enlarged liver within five minutes, you know, because they had an apple and it's like, no, dude, you, you know, you guys can, you know, you mostly eat anything. You just, you gotta be real, you gotta be reasonable with the portion sizes and how often you do it. But, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to determine health because health is such a nebulous term. And I think one of the really uncomfortable facts that people don't want to hear is, you know, the best diet for preventing cardiovascular disease might not be the best diet for looking yeah, fit. That's true. Maybe it is. I don't know. Right. But, and maybe the best diet for cancer is not the best diet for Alzheimer's. And maybe the best diet for Alzheimer's is not the best diet for cardiovascular disease or, or whatever it is. Right. Like yeah. it's going to depend on your goals. And I think we're going to learn in the future, like, Hey, sure. Like if your goal is this, maybe this, but then there's also this. And you know, I, I, there was a, I saw this thing, it was referring to politics. 
uh, but I think it's also true of nutrition. And the, the quote was, there are no solutions, just trade-offs. And I think that that's very, very true. Yeah. And so I think when you approach it with that perspective and you understand that, okay, there's always going to be positives and negatives to whatever approach you pick. You just need to decide, do the positives outweigh the negatives based on your particular goals yes. and what you want to accomplish and what makes sense for you? hundred percent, man. I got, I got into the same thing talking about uh, marriage versus being single with someone. It was, it, it <laughs> was trade off. Like, it's just like, well, you know, you've been, I've been with my wife since high school, right? So I've really never been with any other woman. And it's, and I, I believe it or not, I catch flack. I guess in today's society, that's not cool. I don't know. But it's, you know, so, and it's respectful, right? People will say, well, you know, that's, uh, okay, well, well, again, same thing. Like, what are the trade offs? Okay, I have someone to come home. Well, Thomas, to. if I can interrupt you, I've only ever been with uh, two women in my entire life my ex wife and my current wife. So I, <laughs> I vibe with that a little bit. You know what totally, I mean? Man. Like, uh, it's very it's, rare. It is, it is rare and it's, you know, maybe, you know, for us, that's what, that's what drives with us. That's what works. And that's what, and there's certainly people out there that that would be a huge trade off that they would, oh, you mean that I, I can't go out and sleep around or do whatever I want to do or, or, okay, well, it's a trade off, but that trade off doesn't really matter to me because I strongly prefer having someone to go home to at night and, you know, be with and companionship and so it's the and same kind of thing. And all that kind of thing exactly man it's just like there's there's just these trade-offs and I think I just I respect you a lot because I feel like what what comes through sometimes in short clips if people just watch short clips or they just people might just watch your rebuttal videos or they might they don't like sit back and actually consume your content and I consumed your content long before I was ever even a large brand online and I've known where you've come from and known where you stand. And I just, I know we have to wrap this up because it's going on for a long time. And it, guys, like down below in the comments, if you want us to do a part two, by all means, be happy to. And I'm sure there's a lot of cool stuff we could, could cover. But, you know, I want to, you mentioned something and I want to make sure I touch on it, is that the, you and I both being in the fitness industry, I think we can both attest to the fact that just because someone looks a certain way does not mean that they are healthy on the inside. And uh, in an industry where everything is, it's largely not healthy. And it's, but again, who are we to say it's healthy or not? It's just the point is, is that coming in that industry, you see it all the time. And uh, man, there's a couple things I wanted to make sure I touched on, but I will touch on one more thing, I promise, and then we'll wrap it up. But it's all right. something that we, that I agree on, agree with you on, that I mentioned in another video, it was the, the saturated fat piece, and I don't think we need to like go into detail on it, but people forget that with keto, the ability to overeat is a lot easier. So you have to be extra careful, right? Because people think that consuming a fat bomb, because it's fat and it's not a carbohydrate, it's not going to make them fat. Well, you're pulling a much bigger lever, gram for gram, by having that fat bomb than you would be by having a Sour Patch Kid. Now, I'm not saying you go have a Sour Patch Kid. Don't get me wrong, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying like, you know, gram to calories, like how much the food volume is with how many calories it has. Like if you overeat on that, you bet your bottom dollar you're gonna gain fat. And at the end of the day, and this still gets discounted a lot, is that fat will still store as fat very easily. In fact, it actually stores easier than carbs as fat because it's more similar. It doesn't have to go through a process to turn into fat. So I just, you mentioned that and I just, it's, it's tough because I catch so much flack for that, but it's, it's real. And on keto, in a lot of ways, you, you have to be very, you do need to track, you do need to look at things because it doesn't, you're not absolved of that simply because you're not consuming carbohydrates. It's easier to mess up. And I guess you could say like Spider-Man with, you know, great power comes great responsibility. If you're willing to kind of, you know, go down the keto route and you're trying to like optimize for that and you're into that, then great. But it comes with responsibility too. It's not like a, you can just live this flagrant life and do whatever you want. Yeah, I think just like you can eat a really nutrient dense, you know, minimally processed plant-based diet, you can eat a really nutrient dense, minimally processed ketogenic diet. Yeah. But, it, you know, people want to say, well, keto has appetite suppressing effects. Yeah. But appetite suppression is very dependent on the individual foods. Very, very so. dependent yeah. on the individual yeah. foods. And actually the foods of the unprocessed foods or minimally processed foods 
fat foods tend to be more easy to overeat compared to carb foods. Yeah. Like, I mean, the most, the highest ranking food on a satiety scale is a, a plain baked potato, right? Yeah. To make a, a plain baked potato really, really good, you got to add salt and butter and all this other yeah. stuff, right? Uh, you know, grab a handful of nuts. You can do that all day, right? Yeah. And in fact, there's a funny story. Um, Dom DiGostino, who's one of the leading uh, ketogenic diet researchers, even talked about how one of his family members put on 30 pounds during keto yeah. because they were eating a bunch of bacon and, and, and butter and grease and whatnot. And it's like, you know, their, their LDL went crazy and they put on quite a bit of weight. And it's like, you know, you, know you, still have to, you still have to be an energy deficit, but keto can help with that because it does appear to have some appetite suppressing effects. Um, and then even, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Ethan Suplee. I th actually, I think he was on your yeah, show. Yeah, I had him, yeah, I, so, yeah he's awesome. Yeah. So uh, Ethan talked about how he got stuck at a certain point. Like he lost a lot of weight on keto and then he kind of got stuck and he thought it was because the lettuce in his salad, when in reality it was the <laughs> fact that he was, he was dumping olive oil on his salad, right? Yeah, so yeah. I, I think that that's a really important point to make. But the same, you know, it's funny because ketogenic people will criticize vegan diets. It's like, oh, well, beer and french fries are vegan. You know, you can be plant-based and eating a bunch of crap. Yeah. Well, you could be keto and eating a bunch of crap too. You 100%. know what I mean? And, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to fear monger processed food. There's nothing inherently evil about food processing other than the fact that it makes it much more palatable and easy to overeat. In some cases it does, you know, make put more saturated fat in the food, which can have some independent uh, health issues. But, uh, you know, I would say if you want to have some like processed food, you can, it's fine, but you have to understand that it's going to be much more difficult to moderate that, especially if you're not tracking your calories. I would say to people, if you don't want to track calories, you better be willing to mostly stick to minimally processed foods. If you want to include some processed food, you probably can, but it's going to be much easier to do so if you're tracking because then you can get a good estimation of like how much portion size you can have. Ten, and and yeah. that's, a, that's a big thing that people miss. So I think a great point that you bring up. And, and again, you know, any different kind of diet can help you lose weight. But a lot of it boils down to, you know, what kind of diet quality do you have? Because that diet quality impacts your satiety and impacts how you feel and how much you can move and those sorts of things. And all that stuff's really important. Yeah, no, without a doubt, man. I mean, 10 years ago, shit, 11 years ago now, you know, when I started keto and I was, there wasn't a lot of hyper palatable keto goodies out there. It's so, you know, I lost weight very fast, but by default, when I was doing keto, because the carbs were gone for me, there weren't a whole lot of processed options for me. So it, my default was to go to whole foods, right? It was, it, so, and I, I'm very open about that on my channel that it was, probably easier for me to have success than would I have the same success now? People ask me all the time, you know, if you were the same weight now, would you still do keto? Um, that's a really difficult question, right? Because my large part of my adult life has been keto, right? So I would probably say, yeah, I like it, but um, it's- Well, just look, it, at the, look at the keto ice creams. They're like double the amount of calories as yeah. the regular ice cream, right? Yep, I tell people like if they have a cheat meal, that's a very, a very good point. They're on keto. They want to have a cheat meal. So they go and they pick up the keto ice creams I'm saying like, if you're going to have a cheat meal, have a cheat meal because trust me like, and go get the regular ice cream or go get the halo top non keto ice cream because it's a heck of a lot lower calories. And if you're having a cheat meal, you're having a dang cheat meal. So just do it. Right. And it's because you're going to end up consuming half the amount of calories than if you just consumed the keto ice cream. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I think, and it's like, it's just some of this common sense stuff. I think it needs to be brought back. Otherwise, I mean, my concern, honestly, is that there's a lot of good stuff coming out of the keto world. A lot of good stuff coming out of Oxford, a lot of good stuff coming out with the use of exogenous ketone esters in different uh, you know, performance settings. And it's cool stuff, right? There's cool stuff that's coming out. And it's exciting, at least for me. But a lot of it's gonna end up getting destroyed by outlandish claims and by weird things that are said. And it's, it's just, it's just we have to bring back a little bit of normalcy to how we talk about keto and how it's addressed. Yeah, and you don't want to you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Yeah, precisely. Like, I think that there's absolutely some therapeutic effects of a ketogenic diet. I, mean, I was just looking over some studies on, um, well, it doesn't necessarily at least in the few studies that have looked at it in healthy people it doesn't appear to necessarily improve cognition. Although some people say that they feel better on it, which again, perfectly reasonable reason to do it. Um, 
there appear to be pretty strong evidence for uh, improving Alzheimer's symptoms, dementia, um, as well as uh, like especially epilepsy, because actually yeah. the ketogenic diet originally was was came that, into yeah. being because of epilepsy, because yeah. it's a really great epilepsy treatment. And so, again, if you're an, if you're epileptic, talk to your doctor first, all that good stuff. Yeah. But um, you know, once again, I really think that it's important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I've seen some people even kind of, they're so against the extreme claims of keto that they go too far the other way. And they kind of, they kind of poo poo the ketogenic diet, keep yeah. ketogenic diet for anything. And it's like, well, that's not a good idea either. Like, let's say like there may be some unique effects of this diet. So, you know, as far as fat loss, may, probably not, but for other things, absolutely. So let's, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that's really important. Yeah, I love that, man. I mean, that's such a, that's a great way to put it because if, if keto works for you for losing fat, great, okay. But where I stand is it's not the holy grail of fat loss. For me, it's a lot of different aspects that I enjoy about it. There are a bunch of different ways that I could maintain body composition, that I could maintain my level of leanness. No questions asked. I'm, you know, that is on record, right? It's, I like keto because of the other attributes that I feel I get from it. And yeah, it's exactly. I, mean, I think the most compelling stuff is coming out of the brain world. I mean, network stability. I mean, in interesting, interesting stuff there to say the least. And it's you know being researched in different, uh, different uh, you know defense practicalities and everything too. So it's just awesome. Yeah, and Navy, I'm glad Navy divers helps Navy prevent seizures, depth. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And it's it's just cool to see that research coming out. And I know Dom's a big part of that. And yep. And I just, I appreciate being able to have a cordial discussion. I know, you know, we'll piss a few people off, but it's, uh, it's all good. Cause this is, I think where, where things need to go. I think we need to be able, like you said, reach across the aisle, uh, get insight, realize that people aren't bad people. You know, they're just usually trying to, a lot of times trying to make a buck, you know, they're trying to, you know, just, I always say a squirrel trying to get a nut, but if you're actually able to have conversations with people and level with them or willing to have those conversations, and that's how we actually grow and that's how we actually motivate and inspire and, and keep stuff rocking. Yeah. And I mean, like I'll, I'll be, I'm not too, uh, too proud to admit that, you know, it's very hard to get, uh, eyeballs on your stuff if you're not doing extreme things, I know. right? Like yeah. if you're, it's, it's a big open world in social media and in a way you have to be a loud voice. And yeah. you know, one of the ways I've been able to generate more views on my channel is by tackling some of these big myths. And some yeah. of that is through tackling the people that perpetuate the big myths. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't want to cross that line. I kind of go right up to the line, but I still want to make sure that I'm presenting things in a, you know, it's always like, it's funny. My editor and I will, will sit there like, all right, what's the sexiest title we can make this that still isn't crossing the line yeah. on misrepresenting what this actually says. Right. And that's tough. And that's probably why it's... I have 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. And I get, I get so many um, comments like, how does this channel not have a million or 2 million subscribers? And I'm like, Oh, probably cause I don't go past a certain point, but you know, I'm hoping that over time, you know, the resiliency will build and, it will. and that prevail. sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but again, I'm not too proud to admit that I, I still probably, um, am more aggressive than I should be at times when I'm calling people out. Oh. Man. And it's going to get even crazier with, I mean, I don't know what your personal feelings on it, but with like TikTok and stuff like that, it just frustrates me because you can't like, it's just claims and everything. It's just going to be the wild west again. And I don't, I love like, TikTok. It's an endless source of content for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, man, I can't even. I can't even do it. I, I just like people ask. I just. I just can't because it's just like it's not. I don't know. It's. It's gonna anyway. It's gonna open up a, just a giant can of worms. And like I've said this before. Like I'm. I'm waiting for the day that the you know the FTC and FDA comes like raining hard down on influencers. That you know it's it's because when the TikTok world it's just it's getting way out of hand. And YouTube, yes, you can have a certain degree of like an little bit of a claimy outlandish title because you can actually back it up with a 20 minute video and not even say back it up, but you can explain yourself in a 20 minute video and people might understand like, okay, I understand that that title and thumbnail is to get clicks. But when you actually look at the video, okay, this is what it's about. TikTok. I mean, what are you going to say in 15 seconds? Like it's, yeah. you're basically making this claim in your title and thumbnail and reinforcing it in a 15 second video. So it's very frustrating. And I know we share probably the same sentiments about, you know, YouTube can be very frustrating because 
it's people don't get the full picture because they try to serve people a piece of content they think they want and then it's taken out of context because they're not reaching the, the whole thing, you're getting the whole picture of something you've said before. It's it's frustrating. And, Social uh, media is tough. And, and I tell people, I'm like, just be careful what you wish for in terms of censorship, you know, like in terms of I've gotten people saying like, don't you wish the government would just crack down on these people like, you know, making these claims. And I'm like, ah, I, I tend to be somebody who I think self-policing is better policing. And yeah. the only reason why is you think it'll work out how you want with regulations, but in reality, it's probably going to hurt everybody. Um, as an example, like what if the government said tomorrow, you're not allowed to give dietary advice unless you're a registered dietitian because that's who we consider the experts. Well, I've got a PhD in nutrition, but I'm not a registered dietitian. Yeah. So now I've either got to go become an RD or I've got to stop talking about this stuff. Yeah. And I mean, you're basically trusting that either these social media platforms or the government are equipped to figure out who actually the experts are. And yeah. I don't think that that's necessarily true because they're just made up of people like every other organization. Yeah, exactly. And they're prone to the same biases and, and nonsense as anybody else. So I still think that, you know, I, I see what I do as kind of a service because I'm, I, I look at myself as kind of like being as involved in the checks and balances of things. Um, and I think that that's a better way to do it than having, you know, somebody arbitrarily come in and, and yeah, shut I people down. Totally. Agree I'm not, yep. you know, people were, I know, um, you know, there was uh, Paul Saladino. I think he got his Instagram removed a while back and people were like, Oh, aren't you happy about this? And I'm like, not really because you know, it's him today, but tomorrow it could be me. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's an I think you gotta of, be careful yeah. with that sort of stuff. Um, I, we definitely share the same sentiments there and you know and, and on that note I mean everyone that's a subscriber to my channel I encourage you to go subscribe to Lane's channel like even if you don't agree with everything that he has to say I'm sure there are things that you do agree with so go give him a follow help his channel grow because I'm actually surprised too that you don't have more subscribers but I, I also get it it's it's yeah it's saturated anyway but well go subscribe yep. and if you guys don't like me leave a comment and help me get that engagement you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> exactly i mean and this thing is is like even if you don't agree with them get both sides right i always even politically watch cnn and watch fox right watch both always see both sides so that you understand where each side is coming from and you know you can think with a little bit of uh autonomy there you know it's it's important that you also have your own say with what you're doing with your nutrition and if you take information from one side and one side only that's that's not going to help you much you got to look at the whole equation so man we've been running for like two hours so i think uh for the uh for the few that have distilled down to here i think we've got some some diehards and i'm sure they'll go subscribe <laughs> awesome well, no, I, I appreciate you having me on, man, and uh, uh, hopefully people enjoyed it and it helped them out. And if you want uh, round two, let me know. I'd be happy to do it. Yeah, post it down in the comment section. And where can everyone find you? Just uh, So the central hub is biolane.com. You can find everything we do there. Um, I'm biolane on pretty much all social media platforms. And then our app you referred to earlier, Carbon Diet Coach, is available on iOS and Android. All you got to do is search Carbon Diet Coach or go to joincarbon.com. Perfecto. Cool, man. Well, as always, everyone, keep it locked in. We'll see you guys soon.